Jeff Mills is going to talk to us about BayesTesting.jl. All right, thank you. Yeah, Jeff Mills, uh, University of Cincinnati. And uh, my research for quite some time now has really been up about trying to reduce the tears and frustration with hypothesis testing, mostly for Bayesians, but the idea is really for everybody. Um, we had a big reduction in tears and frustration in the 90s with the rediscovery of Markov Chain Monte Carlo and Metropolis Hastings and all the great work that's come out from using that uh, for Bayesian inference. But the problem is if you look at the applied research, as soon as you go to applied research, you, you try and do all these wonderful um, Bayesian inference approach and come up with a posterior density. And the first thing everybody and the dog wants to do is test a hypothesis, particularly a precise hypothesis. So they end up using a p-value and going back to frequentness methods. So that's a little frustrating if you want to use Bayesian methods. So here's the problem um, we're trying to look at. A uh, wise man once said a picture paints a thousand statistics and Bayesian inference is great for that because you can plot the posterior density and look exactly what's going on in terms of the knowledge you've learned from the data. And if you want to test a precise hypothesis, so some unknown quantity, theta, is equal to some value, usually zero, and we can always take theta sub zero over the other side and make it zero. So we're really all we're doing is looking at where is zero in that posterior density. Um, so you know, one dimensional, it's easy to visualize. What you're trying to do with a hypothesis test is formalize that and it allow set it up so you can look at multidimensional problems, test multiple hypotheses, joint hypotheses, and also when you have a lot of nuisance parameters, other parameters to deal with. So it's harder to visualize. So why all the tiers then? Well, there's, a, there's an extensive literature recently, just in the last few years, in the frequentist uh, literature about p-values. There's editorials making statements about what you should and shouldn't do, and all the statisticians feel like they've created this monster you look at some fields, like medicine is a great example, and every number just has a p-value attached to it, and it's, all they care about is that number less than 0.05 or not. Um, and, and so there's a lot of agreement that it's not a satisfactory approach, but it's sort of, as Churchill said about democracy, it's, it's horrible until you consider all the alternatives, right? So, um, so everybody rushes back to p-values. And if you try and take a Bayesian approach, it's arguably worse than the frequentist approach. And the main reason for that is this thing called the jeffries lindley bartlett paradox. And what happens there is when you compute the Bayes factor, as you increase your prior variance, so you become a lot more uncertain about what the parameter value theta is before you observe the data or conduct the experiment, you increase that variance, saying I don't know. Your posterior Bayes factor becomes more concentrated on the null hypothesis is true. So more odds in favor than null, regardless of the data. So this slope on, the, on your right there is, is going the wrong direction. But the main problem is not even that. It's really that it's too sensitive. So you vary the prior variance, and it, the base factor is very sensitive to that. So it's hard to use it in practice. Uh, the literature for a long time, there's, there's a large literature on trying to find prior distributions that mitigate the effects of the jeffries lindley bartlett paradox when it's had some success, but it's fairly limited success. And you have to invent strange priors that don't really represent your prior information. And they change when you change the hypothesis. So if I'm testing theta equals zero, I use one prior. And if I test theta equals one, I've got to use a different prior that is not really, and it's not the same priors you'd use for inference. There's a lot of priors we use for inference that are, there's a pretty consensus opinion that they're, they're reasonable priors, especially we can use fairly uninformative priors that we can't use for testing. So it seems that the problem's not really the prior, and we're barking up the wrong tree a little bit, trying to find new priors. So if you think about what we're trying to do here, if we wanted to test, for example, whether Serena Williams is the best tennis player in the world, we wouldn't put Serena on one side of the court and everybody else on the other side of the court. We're sort of comparing one apple with a whole barrel full of apples. Oh, same for any sport. Take the World Cup. We wouldn't put France at one side of the pitch and everybody else. Well, maybe if you're English, you would put everybody else the other side of the pitch. But, you know, it's, it's, it's not a good comparison, right? So the problem really is this poorly defined alternative hypothesis, which is a barrel full of apples. And when we do the standard Bayesian approach, what that means is we end up looking at 
the value at the null, zero, say, or some epsilon neighborhood around that, so region around the null, compared to the light green, everything else, so everything outside that region. So it's the one apple versus the barrel, and you compute the Bayes factor, it's just the ratio of those areas, and it's gonna go to zero or off to infinity and beyond, really no matter what you do. So the alternative I'm suggesting is to use the one versus one approach, which is define our null hypothesis as an epsilon neighborhood around the value in the null, and then define a whole set of alternative hypotheses by partitioning the parameter space into a set of epsilon neighborhoods defined by the partition. And then we can compare one versus one. If we do that and do the math, minimize expected loss to choose versus the null hypothesis in each one of these alternatives, we get a usual kind of posterior odds ratio and the critical value is going to be determined by the cost of the type one and type two error. And it turns out that's equivalent mathematically to just considering two points. So the dark region around the null hypothesis, <coughs> excuse me, and the region around the posterior mode. Because if you're gonna reject the null for any region, then you'll reject the region around the mode because that's the highest probability region. And if you fail to reject it for the region around the mode, you're gonna to fail to reject it for any other region. So, so it turns out in practice, all we have to look at is those two regions. And as epsilon goes to zero for those regions, we end up with a posterior odds ratio, which is just the height at the density at the posterior mode, so the maximum a posterior, a posterior estimate, which is the Bayesian equivalent of a maximum likelihood estimate, and the value of the posterior at, at the null hypothesis. So that gives us the odds against the null compared to the most likely alternative. So if we do this, all kinds of wonderful things happen. The jeffries lindley bartlett paradox goes away. We can use the usual priors that we use for inference. And uh, you know, in terms of Julia, we can easily make use of posterior simulation to allow not only exact inference, but also testing. So I'm not asking you to believe it. You know, if you're a scientist, you should be skeptical, or we'd all be dead from drinking snake oil. Um, but so, so that's the motivation for the package, is to, to make this easy to use. So uh, the package is a bunch of functions for doing things like comparing means, the usual hypothesis tests, proportions, difference in differences, regression coefficients, and so on. But the core is really just one function which takes any Monte Carlo sample, so Markov chain Monte Carlo sample or just any, any posterior simulation draws from the posterior distribution and looks at the kernel density and computes the mode, the value of the density at the mode and the value in, under whatever null hypothesis you give. So let, let me give you a couple of simple examples. Uh, just you know, a, a simple hypothesis test, the mean is equal to some value. Well, that's analytically tractable, and it turns out in this, if you do the one versus one comparison, <clears throat> then you get a one-to-one -one correspondence with the T statistic and the p-value. So, you know, a T of around two gives you a p-value of 5%, you get posterior odds of seven to one. As n goes to infinity and the T goes to 1.96, then the, the posterior odds go to 6.8. So there's this nice one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay, great. Uh, Regression analysis, There's a, this is an example from the Bayes, Bayesian fact, Bayes factor uh, literature where we're just looking at proportion of votes received by the presidential election winner and the height ratio that went into the other candidate. Um, the thing to realize about this example is you, you do exactly the same thing for a complicated model, a lot more parameters, uh, nonlinearity, we even have a system of equations. It's the same setup, same Bayesian machinery now for testing as well as inference. Uh, there's a function in a package to run the regression. Uh, you can use key, keyword arguments to define a, an informative prior. Um, and you get these kind of results where we test the null hypothesis, the odds are 51 to 1 against the null hypothesis matching a p-value, whereas the prevailing Bayes factor approach uh, only gives you odds of just over 6 to 1 against the null, which doesn't really match the posterior um, inference. Uh, comparison of means. There's a function for that where you can just give it the two samples or summary statistics, and you get this kind of result where here we've got a treatment, a placebo at the top, and on the right is just the, the density of the difference in those. And then there's a second treatment in the middle, 
and then we can do a difference of the difference. So we can compare the average treatment effect relative to placebo of two different treatments, and the last density there is the difference of the difference, and here we've got odds ratios and, and matching p-values just to show that they compare. Okay, so I have a paper on all the theory. There's a package on GitHub. It's still in its infancy, so I haven't made it in a registered package yet, but that's in the works, and there's several applications where we've used this. Thank you. So, so this is really interesting in, in, in case you have a, like a null hypothesis, but what if you want to decide between two models that might have completely different parameter spaces? So classically you would integrate to get the evidence to the base factor, but that's very sensitive to the prior. Is there some way you can apply this too? If you yeah, actually the last, the last paper there on predictive model selection is looking at that, and there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between t comparing two models and two hypotheses. So really it fits in with the same framework, and you can look at the predictive distribution and compare two models in that sense. So, so yes, you, it, it, it's fairly straightforward to generalize to that setup without having to compute marginal you know, phase factor stuff that causes all the problems. All right, let's thank Jeff again. Thank you.